Welcome to The Spawn Chunks, episode number 73 for Monday, January 27th, 2020. My name is Johnny and joining me as always is Joel Duggan. Hi, Joel. Hello, sir. And if you are new to the show and you're wondering why these guys sound groggy, it's because <laughs> we're, off, we're off our mark. We, we're recording a little bit later today because we have a guest with us. Uh, welcoming back to the show, we have Fix It 412 or 412 or 412. We haven't decided yet. <laughs> uh, current series uh, that Fix It is attempting to uh, complete on YouTube are Vast in Season 5 and Minecraft Bedrock Survival. Welcome back to the show, Fix It. It's been a minute. Hey, guys. Yeah, I can't believe what we were saying. Episode 19 in the render distance. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. 19. We were such a young show at the time, <laughs> still with so many ambitions and looking on onwards to the future always. Yeah, yeah. No, it's great and to have you back. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. We were looking back over uh, a few things and talking about like streaming and what's been going on since the last time we had Fix It on the show in the render distance, which is the pre-show conversation. You can get more of that at patreon.com slash the spawn chunks. So as per usual, we like to let our guests go first. So Fix It, what have you been up to lately in Minecraft? Well, we uh, we started in the realm of Aston. It's uh, the SMP I play on, which is a kind of Kingdom Craft rules uh, server where we all build. It's all community. Like everything's community. We all build in the same place and then move on. And uh, one of the new things that we we did this season, starting in January, is we we're doing steampunk officially steampunk for for a three month a three month season. And uh, boy, it's been a challenge, guys. I've I've never done it, and I've never really been in the sort of steampunk culture i guess if you will and it's a very unique thing and oh well, i guess minecraft steampunk is even kind of its own unique thing right yeah uh, pe people tend to equate steampunk with the kind of mock tudor victorian uh kind of style and more eccentrically built houses so sort of stuff that looks like it shouldn't be standing up on its own whereas i think steampunk as an aesthetic for cosplayers and for uh fiction writers and stuff like that tends to be it's Victorian in essence because that's when steam technology was at its height, but the idea is that steam technology is used for a greater variety of things, and it never really transitioned over into electrically powered stuff, so it can be quite a grungy aesthetic for, you know, cosplayers and stuff. I think the, the joke everyone likes to make is that to make something steampunk, you just get a Nerf gun and you stick a bunch of cogs to it with super glue. Uh, but <laughs> I, I imagine on Vastan it goes well beyond that. Yeah, you know, we we kind of looked at some of the old kingdoms when we were planning for this season, and, and you know, it never felt... Like we build these huge, huge kingdoms, but they never felt huge because I think what we discovered after a lot of talking and, and sorting it out is that we're all too nice, you know, like we're all like friendly, considerate people. And like, so everyone's like, oh, you're building a house there. Let me move over like 50 blocks and I'll build my house over here. So what happens is you might have a, a city worth of houses, but it feels like a town because there's like a mile between each build, you know? Uh, so this season we decided like, look, we're just going to build right on top of each other. Don't, don't worry. If, if I had plans, but there's someone, a house springs up there overnight, then I'll just adjust my plans accordingly. And, and like one night I, I had built a few houses and I went to bed and I came back the next day and I log on and Callus uh, had built two houses literally on top of my houses. And it was just the greatest <laughs> thing. It was so cool. It was something I wouldn't have thought of, but, and so we've just been going that way and trying to add ridiculously oversized things like, <laughs> you know, like a uh, like hundred block wide gears, for example, things like that that don't even necessarily really have a purpose, but they look really cool. So uh, that kind of stuff. But it's been really fun. It's been a fun new sort of a uh, uh, style to learn how to build in. I like the idea of building a town that way, almost like the houses are plants competing for light on the floor of a forest, <laughs> yeah. and you just kind of yeah. have to grow everything higher and you know closer together until it sort of reaches peak capacity, and that really adds character to a place. Minecraft builds can often feel like they are just plonked down in the landscape next to each other when they get that kind of spread out, and so building it organically like that feels like, well, obviously, like you said, there are chances of treading on other players' toes if there's a a gentleman's agreement between you all that you're not going to care about that stuff. I feel like it can lend to a really different creative process. It really has. And it's, it's been so, I, I think like successful in how the city's grown. I mean, we're only 27 days in, but uh, that we're already all like, yeah, this is the way we've got to go forward for now on. Just, just build. And if someone has a house, start one block over and build the next thing, you know, cause that feels like an actual place and not just like, like a never ending tiny little village that stretches for 500 blocks, you know? 
Is there an end goal in mind other than a three month span? Is there something big that you're building up to? Uh, no, you know, there. Everyone has kind of their own projects. Uh, I'm about ready to dig in for a castle, a steampunk castle with a uh, with Callus. We're gonna team up on it and uh try to figure out a, a lore based way to have you know a, a castle but also steampunk but also victorian <laughs> sort of nature mm -hmm. and and sort of a hodgepodge of all these different styles uh but you know the, the the time thing uh you know i know joel we talked about it so much uh you know i i think you got with minecraft it's important to put a pin in it you know especially when you're building like this because you'll never end like when are you done you're not done there's always more custom trees or custom landscape or houses you can add so you have to kind of kind of say, okay, this is it. This is the ending. And then we're going to start a new, start a new kingdom somewhere else. So plan accordingly. Don't start a build that's going to take you four years to com complete or, or don't start a build that's going to take you a week to complete and then have nothing to do, you know? So I think mm. it's helpful. Have you ever thought on Vastin to set up a small perimeter, like a small circle or, or square of, uh, like square root of chunks and be just like, we all have to build in here. Like, you know, it, just to try to encourage that, that, um, density. It, it's, it's very interesting. We already have sort of been shooting the breeze about the next season, uh, and about maybe doing a really planned city. I know the Citadel has come up, uh, frequently, uh, in our talks about how you guys are, are doing it like based on, on chunks, right? Like for blocks and things like that. And, and maybe about like setting, like maybe building the walls first and be like, okay, this is it. This is it. This is the, so you just got to build up or down, but you can't go left or right or right. Uh, based on chunks, what do you mean? Well, weren't you doing like a, the, for, from my understanding, and I could be wrong because again, I've missed many of your streams, but you're doing like, like block, like city blocks for the modern city. Oh, 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 yes. I see what you mean. When you said chunks, I thought you meant like Minecraft chunks, like the eight, this, the eight by eight or 16 by 16, whatever they are. They're eight by eight, right? Um, chunks. No, uh, yes, you are correct. Yeah. So the way that we, the reason we did that was to ease the communication between, uh, Sit, uh, between um, server members, right? So you can just show up at a at a city block, which we've determined to be 31 blocks by 31 blocks, and just stick a, a sign down like, this is mine. Nice. And I'm going to build firehouse. Or or we can go around and plan it, say, well, this is going to be a church, and this is going to be an office building, and this needs to be retail or whatever, because we're building a modern city. And that way, every block either has to be 31 or part of 31. Now, you don't have to build on the whole lot. If you wanted to make a park with a small you know, bodega in it, then you can do that too. But the idea being that the, the, what we do has to be divisive into like the 31 by 31. Um, and it's helped me cause I'm doing most of the road planning right now. It's helped me kind of map out, uh, and easily decide, okay, well, if I want a road to go roughly here, rather than humming and hawing and trying to figure out like which which part of the Minecraft landscape do I want to utilize and bulldoze? And do I want to go three blocks that way or four blocks this way? Instead, I just went back to the, the city blocks and said, okay, well, I'm either going to build four blocks and make a road or five blocks and make a road. Like I don't have a choice. I've established that these city blocks are X, Y. Right. And so it was really helpful in helping me, like you said, you know, that, you know, you're never done. You're always going to have one more custom thing, one more little tweak. So I, I tend to overthink a lot of my builds before I actually place any blocks or dig anything. And so having the, the set block radius was something that allowed us on the Citadel to be just like, sweet. Okay. Well, I don't want to go any closer to the water. So the road goes here. <laughs> It has to, because otherwise it screws up all the counting I did last week. So that's it's going to be there, and it's worked out. Like it, it's 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 a it's a nice grid. It it helps with the the no thinking. Like I I didn't want to get into like spaghetti planning with roads and trying to do curves in Minecraft is always such a a pain. Oof, and yeah. without the without the the blocks to really do the kind of things that you want to do with a modern city, um, your road textures are pretty limited in Minecraft. So, um. It helps to have a grid because it keeps it flat. You know, it allows you to use concrete powder and concrete and and slabs and things when you when when you can, and it, it helps in that in that way. Um, I guess I can keep on uh, talking about the Citadel because that's what I was on this weekend. We did a little bit of work doing the road work, and it's amazing how adding in uh, a couple of intersections has really taken this. This is the plan for the city into, oh, wait, I'm starting to see the city block and the median and the roads. And you can start to sort of visualize how traffic might move or how people might see the city. And this is very much feeling like this is the downtown, you know, as opposed to the, you know, the retail district or residential or whatever. So um, that was a lot of fun. Um, but also 
Uh, my week has been mostly swallowed up because, of course, I've discovered that this is a time sink <laughs> thanks to uh, to Pixel Rose from last week. I've been playing Skyblock. I was going to say, Skyblock is going to be quite refreshing after all of the city planning stuff. You're like, I have all of this area to work with. And then you're like, I have none of that area to work with because it's all the <laughs> void now. Yeah. Well, you, you say that and I've found two things that are creeping up on me. Uh, playing Skyblock, which I am enjoying, I because I'm a technical guy when I when I build Minecraft. I am a builder, but I do like the sorting systems and like the the technical stuff about mob farms. I I really enjoy all that kind of stuff. But I am one really sick of cobblestone, uh, and I've only been playing for like you know three sessions, three streams, um, and but I and which is weird because while I'm sick of it, I also have a lot of wood. I could be easily building a lot of things out of oak wood. But I'm not <laughs> for what I don't know why. Um, and then uh, I also find that I am rethinking and overthinking and trying to come up with some cool like grid or just systematic way of I just want to come up with a pattern that I can repeat so I don't have to think about where I'm putting new blocks. If I want a new thing, I'm just going to build a new platform and and build the thing on it. And I didn't want it to be two all over the place very similar to the nether network on the citadel i kind of wanted to have some sort of like primary direction north south east west kind of grid of rooms and i think i've finally sorted that out but i've rebuilt platforms like three times i think which is again just a giant waste of time and letting letting my perfectionist self kind of get into skyblock where it maybe doesn't belong it's it's hard to shed that i've been playing the same server for three years we're at endgame and we're trying to make these really cool aesthetic builds to a new world in Skyblock where I'm just like, well, this shouldn't matter, but for whatever reason, my brain just won't let me do that. Um, I am playing on the Dr. Trog Skyblock four map, which is the one that, that you're on Pixel Refs. And I really enjoy it so far. Like I, uh, it was fun to finally get that second water source and expand the cobblestone generator. I, I made some tweaks so that now the cobblestone generator will, the water flow will actually sends the items back to me. So I don't have to go get them. They just kind of show up in my lap, which is fantastic. Um, makes it easy to chat with the chat room when I'm streaming. Um, the other thing that I, I was really happy about was some of the, I guess, techniques in terms of early game stuff that I didn't have to do when I was on the Citadel because we found uh, dungeon spawners very early on the Citadel. So we didn't need them for XP. We didn't necessarily need to do darkroom spawners because we found a skeleton spawner and we found some cave spider spawners. So we were kind of set from the, the early days. Um, so my darkroom spawner... You and I talked about this during the week. Uh, my first one, I tried to use the whole turtle egg technique that Skyblock gives you. And they, you know, you tempt the zombies off the, off the edge. Epic fail. I was getting one or two mobs. Like it just, it was not at all working. Mm -hmm. And then I switched to a old twist on an etho design that I, that I saw. And it's just platforms. It's just two by two platforms surrounded by trap doors that are open. Uh, with a two wide space, another platform, repeat, you know, and I've got 12, 16, I think I've got 18 platforms, uh, all stacked on top of each other in a little dark room. This thing pours out mobs like you wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, it was, it's really refreshing to know that as, as far as Minecraft has come, uh, those mechanics are still great and still very workable. And if, and when I ever start a new world, you know, whether it's modded or, you know, whatever I do, uh, or if I go off into a new, if I get off into a new part of the Citadel, I know that I'm going to be able to come up with a really solid dark room spawner. That's low tech. It's water. That's it. It's water and, and wood is all you really need to get this thing going. And so I've been really enjoying that. And, uh, and just, and just learning new things about mechanics that I kind of take for granted as a, as a forever world player, you know, yeah. it tends it to be, um, what sort of looking for, um, like mob spawning stuff you don't really think about it too much when you've got all the gear and where like it doesn't really matter that you're surrounded by zombies sometimes you know yeah and it's it's really interesting trying to farm specific mobs that you wouldn't even bother farming in survival like husks being the example i'm thinking of right now because i just finished building a farm for them in the small desert area that you have in skyblock and Normally, you don't think about the husk spawning mechanics at all, because why would you need them? But in Skyblock, they drop sand, which is a non-renewable block in vanilla, so it is required to progress to a certain extent. You can use sand to make glass, then to make glass bottles, which you're going to need if you want to get villagers, because you need to cure zombie villagers in order to get those. 
And so it feeds into the Skyblock progression pretty well that husks drop sand. The thing about husks, of course, is that I don't know if anyone's ever been caving in a desert, but you don't tend to see them pop up in caves. And the reason for that is they only spawn on the surface. So to create a husk farm, you can't just make a traditional dark room because if they've got a block above their head, they don't spawn. So you have to build a platform that is open to the elements, open to the sky at least, so you can only spawn them at night. And then you've got to figure out a way of getting them off of that platform so they fall to their death. And I've done it with a, a dispenser. I was able to get a an iron ingot and a bit of redstone so that I could... Wait, not an iron ingot. The iron ingot was for something else. But uh, you, you, a bow and some redstone makes a dispenser with some cobblestone. And um, I've... I needed a way to trigger that, and people were suggesting all kinds of things they'd seen in other people's series, but I wanted to do something a bit different. So I went fishing until I had two tripwire hooks from fishing, and then from below, I set it up so the farm itself is 30 blocks above me. I'm standing on a cobblestone slab platform around the level of the void, and I throw a fishing bobber to hit a tripwire above me, and that's what flushes the mobs off the platform. So I'm still triggering it manually. It's not necessarily something I can AFK at, but then I'd have to walk around and collect up all the drops anyway. So instead, it's this manual thing that's triggered by a fishing bobber because you don't have access to the kind of components I would normally use to make a redstone clock. There are so many different things to think about in Skyblock that just you know, wouldn't occur to you in a normal world, because in a normal world, you can just go mining until you find redstone, or you can go mining mm. until you have iron. Like, right. I, don't ev I don't even have enough iron that I could use to make gear yet. I'm still using stone tools and will be until I can set up an iron farm using villagers. It's just such a different mentality. You've really got to think so much about what's renewable, what's accessible to you at the time, and then the technology progression probably comes along in leaps and bounds once you have an iron farm but you've really got to work hard to get to that point mm. fix it do you have you ever done any skyblock stuff you know i i haven't i've been kind of feeling the urge i've been watching you know watching you and play and i know uh sausage and whip just started a thing how do you feel i watched your uh, cobble clicker series uh, how do you feel the differences between the bedrock cobble clicker in java skyblock it's it's very different with cobble clicker because you don't even get cobblestone because they use cobblestone as currency and as soon as you mine it it disappears and increases like a an on-screen counter by one so you can't make stone tools in that you have to start with wood and then you either get pickaxes from i think zombies always spawn with pickaxes and they drop pickaxes so you have to set up a zombie spawner uh, but also as you increase the cobblestone um, counter, new islands start to appear in the sky. So realistically, if you want to just grind, once you have a cobblestone generator set up, you can do that until everything else on the map has appeared. But as they, like, as, as you progress in that map, they give you ways of automating that. And there are basically gadgets that will eat cobblestone for you and they kind of crush it up and it turns into points automatically. So effectively, you are then choosing how to farm points as an additional sort of resource on top of all of the other stuff that you can farm. So I feel like it's it's a simpler experience because it requires a lot less thought on the player's part in terms of knowing the mechanics of vanilla Minecraft. It's a bit more guided for Bedrock players, but then the map is probably pitched at players who are either newer to Minecraft or players who are a little bit younger, um, and it just appeals to, to everyone. But I found it perfectly fun to play, and especially with... Uh, with company i was playing it with my friends loy who i do the hermitcraft recap with and yeah he and i had mm. a whale of a time with that map it was it was fun for a short series I, not something that i would spend ages on like i am with my vanilla skyblock series but still a lot of fun I, i've been kind of feeling the the pull of that map in particular i haven't done it yet but i i have it and it's, it kind of looks at me whenever i open bedrock every every time yeah, there is a new one called Chicken Block, which is kind of similar to the Chickens mod that you might have seen in packs like Foolcraft, or um, I think there's a couple of other Skyblock packs uh, in Java that have it, but uh, this is basically a bedrock implementation of that where chickens can be bred together to effectively lay different kinds of materials. So you end up with a... You have a dirt chicken, uh, a stone <laughs> chicken, and something else if you breed those two together you get a chicken that poops out gravel and oh, then funny. um you don't even start with the lava and water source that you would need to make a cobblestone generator but you either get a chicken that produces cobble for you or you end up with you know a uh 
a, a combination of chickens that can produce a bucket of water and it kind of goes from there so effectively you're ch just kind of micromanaging all of these animals and figuring out what combinations of them almost like alchemy like in a in a modern nice. like thorncraft or something like that it's it's interesting and he and i me, me and zoya are um eyeballing that with a view to doing a sequel series to cobble clicker where we just yell at chickens every week <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see whether that one uh, if we have enough time for it but we were talking about maybe streaming that on thursday where he can record episodes for it and i can just have something that i can throw up on twitch so we'll see that's fun but yeah Sky, so skyblock I'd, I'd fever is kind of gripping everybody at this point yeah bef before before we move on out of curiosity is that something because uh, what chickens do and like whether or not they lay an egg drop a feather or etc that's probably just a loot table right like so in theory you could have a very simple data pack that might change what a chicken is going to lay provided if you're only just telling it to to just drop a different item in minecraft like it you're not making anything up you're just deciding whether it's going to do dirt gravel cobble you know glass whatever uh, that could be really fun as just like a thematic rp kind of like you know chicken world where like every every chicken matters you know glass chicken sand chicken dirt chicken like <laughs> It just, it just it tickles me the idea of these things being so important yeah it's actually really amusing with bedrock they now have the ability to add in new mobs effectively like the, oh, the right the bedrock uh scripting api and all of the add-ons and stuff basically now allow you to add new mobs to the game so you could add all of these chickens without removing stuff like cows it's not taking up the data that a cow would um so you can effectively copy paste the behaviors of a chicken and effectively you know cook up a new mob with its own loot tables and stuff attached to it uh for the for the making of maps like this typically but uh yeah you could enhance vanilla with that if you wanted to i suppose very very cool uh have you been splitting your time between skyblock and survival guide or is skyblock kind of taken over uh survival guide is still going and i'm alternating between the two uh it actually gives me time to do some of the larger projects that i'm aiming towards in survival guide which right now is i'm starting to shape out mountains at the ski resort town that i was working on before christmas so uh this is my first major terraforming build um it's it's going to be pretty large because i didn't want it to just be one mountain because for a ski resort that seems like you know you go up one mountain you come down one mountain it's not a huge amount of fun so i thought i would probably start out uh you know go big or go home make an entire mountain range and i've been uh watching some videos by a friend of the show f whip about how to uh sort of plan out mountains and stuff like that it's been super helpful uh so yeah survival guide is going to be largely that from now on but i've basically run through all of the smooth stone i had just figuring out the wireframes of how high these mountains are going to be wow. and what, what some of the slopes are going to be and stuff so i'm going to do a lot of haste beacon mining in the days to come i think <clears throat> yeah fix it do you guys have uh mountains on Bastion, or is it mostly just uh castles and we have a couple custom mountains i i did i did an upside down custom mountain uh recently here in the end um, I wanted to build a, uh, I wanted to build a floating, like a floating Island, a uh, pretty big scale. So I basically did exactly what you did on uh, today's episode of survival guide, except for upside down, um, mm -hmm. with, with a fairly flat roof and, and boy that, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of stone. I, I, luckily, you know, our world's four years old and we have a bunch of people mining. So I didn't actually have to go mine it myself because yikes, but, uh, yeah, it, it, it takes, it takes a mighty long time. I, the good part about well, the good and the bad. The good part is when you're building a floating mountain, you don't have to texture quite as much as you do like when you can see it, you know, uh, above ground. Yeah. But what I didn't count on is the end has a different light map, which I learned of after I built the whole thing where you can like, you know, if you built a floating island in the overworld, it would be all in shadow. You wouldn't even see it. So I thought, oh, that's just cool. I'll just build all, all smooth stone. You'll never even see it. Well, in the end, you can see absolutely every block even underneath it. And uh, it's very apparent that it's not textured. So... Uh, so someday <laughs> I may have to texture from underneath this floating island that I built. Uh, but I, f I feel like Mojang needs to add like abseiling as a feature now, just so you can get down there and figure that out without having to uh, risk falling into the void. Oh my goodness! And it's and of course it goes down to like Y one too. You know, so yeah. like I have I have no room to deal with. Uh, yeah, oh, no. I just. And we can all blame Whip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Raising the bar in Minecraft exactly. across the board. Yeah. 
Well, speaking of the bar on Minecraft creeping ever forward, uh, moving on into the news, we've got uh, Minecraft Java Edition 1.15.2 is out. Uh, you can find the notes over there at minecraft.net. Some features that we mentioned last week with the snapshot are added do patrol spawning and do trader spotting as game rules. They've added a GUI light option in block models to allow controlling light when rendering the model in a GUI item. Uh, bee spawning has changed for the better. Any birch or oak sapling grown near a flower with two blocks within two blocks distance, excuse me, on the same Y level has a 5% chance of having a bee nest. Bee nests now have a 2% chance of spawning in a flower forest. Bee nests now have a 0.2% chance of spawning in a forest, wooded hills, birch forest, tall birch forest, birch forest hills, and tall birch hills biomes. So lots of new opportunities to get bees without having to travel around forever, which is fantastic. There are a host of bug fixes. Most of them are important. I would encourage everybody to read the notes, but the few that I picked out that I thought were worth mentioning again are falling down ladders while wearing elytra. No longer a thing, we hope. Hoppers harvesting honeycomb from beehives and bee nests only pick up one honeycomb. That has been fixed. Furnace minecarts do not lose power after navigating corners anymore. Did that fix furnace minecarts? Stay tuned. Bees do not remember how many crops they've pollinated. So if you're using bees to help your crops grow, especially in a, a map like Skyblock, then this uh, moving forward will hopefully help that be a little bit more, uh, I guess, efficient. On the Minecraft Dungeons side of things, we've got a new diaries on the YouTube channel about sound. And there is also a, an accompanying post on Minecraft.net. We'll have both linked in the show notes. Built on a base of vanilla Minecraft sound and music design, they are moving it to add a little bit more of a creepy vibe to it. I really enjoyed the, the information that they put out there in this, uh, in this little snippet. Uh, there are also satisfying arcade sounds and a villager choir. We're going to get into this a little bit more in the discussion. Yeah, uh, moving on from that, but we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, I wanted to signpost that there is now another chance for Java Edition players to claim a free Windows 10 Edition code if you purchase Java Edition before October 19th, 2018. This offer originally ended back at the end of 2018. I think we even mentioned it at the time as a news item here on the Spawn Chunks, uh, but they have got hold of a bunch of new codes that they can give out to Java players, and you have until the 20th of April of this year, 2020, in order to redeem that free Windows 10 Edition code. And originally, they were giving out the Windows 10 Edition beta version uh, before, I think, the Better Together update brought together all of the uh, console platforms aside from PS4. PS4 is now on Bedrock as well, so there is really no better time to swipe up that Bedrock Edition code and play with any of your friends who may not have Java Edition. Uh, also, the obligatory Optifine update now for this podcast. Uh, as of January 27th, Optifine for 115.1 is 71% done. I would assume that they'll be rolling on to 115.2 as their target version, seeing as everyone will be playing in that version by now. But yeah, with only 30% of the work left to do, Godspeed you Optifine devs, and hopefully we get there soon. So with uh, the 1.15.2 update, uh, I've rolled both the patron server and uh, my the Citadel over to uh, 1.15.2. I, I, it seems to be fine with me. I'm still getting the odd ghost block, but other than that, I'm not noticing a whole lot of uh, issues. Uh, have not gone personally to go look for bees. Uh, the people that want bees on the Citadel already had them, so it hasn't been an issue there. We have, however, taken full advantage of the Pillager Patrol and Wandering Trader on off switch that they have provided, which I think is really good. I, I like that they give you that kind of control. Um, Alistair on the server decided to uh, capture a few for some dungeon aesthetics that he's working on. And so after he got them, he was then able to turn them off. And mm -hmm. I thought that that just, it just, it opens up the ability for players to control something that is either annoying or possibly griefing them if they're not very good at PVE. Uh, and have a more enjoyable experience. But when you are ready for a challenge, you can either seek out a pillager outpost or just turn the the patrols back on and deal with them as you find them. I think it's yeah, it's very good that they're separating the pillager patrol controls from spawning yes. at pillager outposts. That's very significant because 
and instead of completely disabling the option to get bad omen you're limiting it to specific structures it's as though you know we had an elder guardian that spawned randomly at our bases and gave us mining fatigue when we didn't want it mm-hmm. you know it's mm-hmm. it's kind of a pain and while i yeah i i dislike the wandering trader and pillager patrols in a kind of joking way i find it fun to just like roll my eyes and and laugh in disbelief when i'm moving some very important villagers out of my villager breeder into my trading hall and i go around a corner and there's an entire patrol pointing their crossbows at me i'm just like of all the timing maybe it's just because i work with villagers a lot but it seems like they only ever turn up when i've got villagers i want to move um but i've i've decided not to disable either of them in the survival guide world at least because it is kind of more entertaining when they show up rather than it being too annoying for me but i can totally understand on servers especially servers where they show up people don't know exactly how to handle pillager captains people get bad omen raids start and it goes from bad to worse i feel like it's uh, a lot more deliberate if you're going out to an outpost and finding bad omen that way yeah we've got situations on the citadel where we've got uh villager breeders or villager trading halls that are registering as villages that are not visible from the pathway that you're standing on like they're either under you or they're hidden behind something or they're part of a villager farm that you can't see and so you might trigger a raid thinking you're fine and then realize oh crap i forgot that i was within range of these two villagers that are inside that building over there yeah and that thus has then you know then that player and sometimes that player only has 45 minutes to play minecraft that day and they don't want to spend 20 of that dealing with like wave after wave of of raids because we have the server on hard so they it would become a bit of an issue it's, that's seven waves yeah it mm-hmm. is it's disruptive and you don't always want it uh on the flip side of that i now in a skyblock world have come around on the wandering trader <laughs> because <laughs> um i was doing some tree farming in my skyblock world and my dark oak tree didn't give me enough saplings to replant another dark oak tree so my only way of getting dark oak saplings now is waiting for the wandering trader to show up and hoping i have emeralds when he sees me so there's there's some really interesting dynamic stuff about the wandering trader that obviously makes him useless in a standard vanilla world where you've already explored a whole bunch but in skyblock he is probably going to be indispensable at a certain point so Mm. i'm looking forward to getting him not to mention the fact that he is the only way to acquire coral blocks and that's the only way you can multiply the sea pickles that you start with there's there's all kinds of things that you can use the trader for in skyblock that i'm looking forward to him being my new best friend uh, he's so far he's shown up twice and i haven't had any emeralds so unfortunately his llamas went the way of leads and leather but there you go um have you have you done any b stuff in vast and fix it you guys moved on to 115.2 we you know we did actually uh we'll probably talk about it later on here but we're, we're officially a realm again like it started out originally so we get the update the day everyone else gets it sure. um and, uh, you know, I, I am not super incre- incredibly interested in, in bees as a primarily builder. Um, I, I think it's cool. It's fine. It's great. You know, a new, a new mob, new aesthetic. I think that's, that's fun. But, you know, the Wondering Trader, it'd be really nice if they would buy just like one item, you know, maybe a random yeah. item each time and maybe only four. But like that way I see Wondering Trader in a, in a four-year-old world and like, pff, you know get away but if he bought something i'd run over and see oh maybe he's buying four stacks of gravel for four emeralds why do that you know some something it would be nice and then maybe there'd be a use uh, a use for them in old worlds in um in, yeah in vast and we didn't turn off pillager patrols um uh, because i think I like having hard things in the game, um, although I don't really like raids, but I like having mobs that, you know, can potentially do some damage, especially as I only wear leather armor uh, now. So I think that's kind of fun. But we what we do have is in all of our adventure guilds all over the world, we have a kill pillager button. It's like we call, you know, calling the rangers. And it's just a, a you know, a, using a command with a command block and it will just kill them. So if someone's like, okay, this is ridiculous. I need to get some work done. You, you run to the Rangers, you call them out and you press the button and all the pillagers go bye-bye. I like that. It's like calling the city watch kind of. Exactly. Yeah. And it fits in the, in the lore too. You know, we we're very lore based. Yeah. So there's a, a bit of a story element to it too. You can't just type it in your console. You have to go to there where the Rangers are and you know, press the button please can, please tell me it has a custom sound effect like gimli blowing on the horn that's what I, deep. you know what actually it's really funny i i started working on adding <laughs> some custom sound effects to our uh, our next texture pack so it very well may <laughs> that's, <awesome. laughs> that's amazing yeah. 
so I, good. I can see the honeycomb blocks actually being really good for the steampunk style of things. They've got that very kind of tessellated texture to them, and it, it gets it, it's it sort of borders between steampunk and art deco almost. Right. So there could be some places to work those in, but they are quite arduous to farm i guess now that the uh hopper collection of honeycomb has been fixed a little bit i was using hopper minecarts to gather mine because the honeycomb would just go everywhere when it was produced by the block automatically oh. but uh yeah i i feel like if you you set up a, a set of dispensers auto shear that you can probably set up a fairly efficient farm and yeah that takes the pain out of having to farm honeycomb all the time manually um so that's that's pretty useful um, I'm enjoying being able to spawn bee nests for a start on the Skyblock world because I started the map before he updated it to include a bee nest. Um, and also the bees have a tendency to fly downwards to find a block to hover over, which in Skyblock ev eventually means they just fly into the void and never leave. Um, and I think for aesthetic purposes in survival, bee nests are a very pretty block and only being able to find four of them in my world was kind of a shame. I thought it would be nice to have more. So now that you can farm them, I had a, a go at farming them. I managed to get eight within about 20 minutes. So despite the fact they only spawn in 5% of trees when you grow them near flowers, it's really not that difficult to get a decent supply of them. I, I love that they're renewable now. I, I I think it was maybe on an earlier episode of your podcast that you guys were talking about how you know they're, one of the goals is to have basically everything be renewable and that's a great thing. That's a great addition, especially again for old worlds. Like, well, all of us have a whole lot of hours put into our three worlds, you know, and uh, it, it's nice to have a way to get those things wherever you want them to be. It's never been more at the forefront of my mind than when I've been playing Skyblock of like, everything in this game should be renewable. I need to farm all the things. Yeah. <laughs> so that's where I'm at right now. Um, I reckon that's about it for the news. Unless you had anything to say about dungeons, Joel. I know you were quite keen on the, uh, well, the dungeons diary. I did want to bring it up a little bit only because uh, it's not the most exciting YouTube video. It's a lot of talking heads. A lot of the conversation around sound is interesting, but there's not a lot of visual, showy, flashy dungeon footage that we're used to seeing in these snapshots. Um, it's an interesting video. Uh, and they do say, you know, they drop some little tidbits here and there if you're paying attention. One of the uh, audio engineers was talking about the music that, that they were composing for uh, the crypt in the creepy woods. And so right away, I was like, okay, so there's creepy woods, as it sounds like maybe a zone or a level. And then there's a crypt underneath it. And I thought, okay, that's really cool. And he was talking about like how the the composition was descending uh, tonally. So you feel like you're going down, you know, as you go into the crypt, which I thought was really, really cool. Uh, but the other thing that I thought was absolutely hilarious and worth going and watching this video just to hear uh, a little bit of this is that they brought in a choir, much like you have a creepy choir in a lot of these fantasy dungeon games that have like this weird, you know, creepy overtone, a lot of like moaning and stuff like that. Well, to take it to the next level, the choir doesn't actually say any words. They sing like villagers would sing. And as you might imagine, that sounds. So combined with the notes and the descending composition and a bunch of pe bunch of like professional choir singers going like Hur. but but much better than that uh it is both haunting and hilarious at the same time i i didn't get a chance to watch this video before we started the podcast that sounds incredible it's the first thing i'm going to do once we're done recording yeah is check it's that a short out, watch that the, yeah they're, they're all like six five six minutes but it, it's worth checking out and I, I want to kind of pay pay some attention to some of the I guess uh, really the hard work that they're putting into dungeons, it really feels like they're they're doing like a love letter to dungeon crawlers with a Minecraft stamp on it. And I'm really more and more excited for the game the more that I watch these little uh, dungeons diaries on, on YouTube. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I'm the same way. I, I, I was, you know, I was always like, oh, this would be fun to play. Now I'm, I'm actually really eagerly anticipating it. You know, I don't know if you guys know, I, I'm a musician like in real life. That's like kind of my, my day job. So watching that from a, a musician standpoint was really interesting. And hearing about the, the descending arpeggios and all that kind of stuff I, I i'm you know i'm grateful that you sent that over my way because i didn't see it joel but it, it's a it's a great great watch i've always Thanks, yeah i've always found the recording process for stuff like that really cool as well um and looking at like film sound and how they do foley work for movies and stuff has always been really interesting mm, to me so mm -hmm. 
I, I will definitely check that one out. But we're going to roll on into chunk mail now. Uh, and considering we were talking about PvE and how difficult that is and being able to disable some of the uh, pillager raids and stuff like that, it, this one kind of ties into that. We had an email from Guy uh, for, who had some thoughts related to our discussion last week, I think, about the combat snapshot that Jeb put out in the last little while, who says, Hey, Pix and Joel, and fix it. First time writing in, I have some notes about combat and its upcoming changes from both a vanilla and a modded development perspective. My most driving force in writing this email is from the changes to weapon damage and healing. The changes in 1.9 weren't nearly as world-ending as many made them out to be. I liked the lack of spamming, I enjoyed getting into the rhythm of swings, and I'd hoped for charging bonuses and unique weapons in subsequent updates. Well, you kind of got that with the crossbow and the trident, but uh, yeah, they, they look like they are getting a little bit more of a boost in the combat snapshots. Anyway, the email continues. Uh, the shield was added to keep you safe from immediate enemies, with the caveats that you're slowed down and can't easily fight back while you're guarding. Now with chopping in the combat snapshots, you can bypass that, making PvP more interesting. Weapons also do less overall damage, but are getting more and more interesting effects like reach and charging. Honestly, Minecraft desperately needed a spear or a javelin style weapon. Tridents originally only had their throwing and retrieval as an incentive for usage, now their reach makes their melee abilities actually worthwhile. Ever since I got into mods, I've always loved the feel of modded food items, partly for their fun, but more so for their utility. See, the best food for saturation was and is the golden carrot, sparing that because of its cost you have beef. But as I mentioned I love food mods, most add some sort of high saturation but low hunger items. That is, they restore a lot of the invisible saturation bar, but only provide a little bit of actual food content. I rarely get down below 16 points of hunger, so anything that restores more than 6 points is largely wasted. My favourites are bibimbap and fruit salad, <laughs> which are quite very different items uh, than what we have in Minecraft already, I guess. Uh, this is especially necessary when fighting, say, the Wither, Wither Skeletons, and the most painful modded boss ever, the Gaia Guardian. The combat snapshot changes finally allow me to deplete my hunger bar further without losing the ability to heal quickly, which is very good and adds a bit more balance to the game since I'll heal for longer, not faster. Armor and shields are suddenly twice as valuable, the wither is somewhat scary again, as well as all its withering cousins in the modded world, and I can run even harder for my life. As far as actually using the combat snapshots, I haven't played enough of them to really say how much or how little I like the feel of them. So far, I felt like we're getting a lot of very nice compromises from the older system, the newer one, and other elements that could make combat better. All in all, I'm pleased to say that combat will fo probably follow the saying, third time's the charm. Have a good week, Guy. Thank you for that email, Guy. It's very in-depth and it's really interesting to hear about the modded world and how that plays into things, because I hadn't really considered that all of the changes that are going to be impacting players for the future of combat are also eventually going to be rolled into whatever the modded scene is doing at the time, and they're going to have to rebalance a lot of the extended arsenal of weapons that you get from some of the other mods. Just thinking about how Tinker's Construct is going to change once all of the, you know, weapon reach and attack recharge time and stuff like that really gets implemented further down the line is mind-boggling at this point. Yeah, I thought uh, that guy did a really good job articulating all the different points and basically does a good job of outlining what I fall short on with combat uh, and why I don't really have much to add is that I don't know if I'm going to have a lot to say until I actually have a chance to live with this for a little while, you know, use it in game. Uh, I do notice after playing Skyblock that I'm just eating melons. Like the, in Minecraft, food seems to be just find a one solution and then don't worry about anything else. Mm -hmm. And I guess early on, it might depend on when you find a melon or when you find wheat and like, what's your first crop? And that might be what you eat for now. But, um, you know, for us in the Citadel, it, we had a chicken farm early on and we've been carnivores ever since. Um, but on Skyblock, I was like, well, I've got these melons and they're growing fast enough that I, even with a manual farm, I've not had to seek out other food sources. So I'm curious to see how, combat is going to affect food in minecraft i didn't think about that last week which i think was a really good point uh fix it what do you think about the combat changes well you know i i'm i'm no pvp pvp or in any way at all i'm just too old for it but um you know so <laughs> <laughs> my focus uh on, on on weapons is really primarily focused on on world building and interest sake and you know what you can do to mix it up and things like that so i'm really i would really look at it at the weapons aspect from a PVE and interest standpoint, you know, and, um, I think there's, I think there's, there's a few problems, uh, with it. Um, 
you know, I I think that shields are are for the most part useless because I I'm a I'm I'm a, not a good I'm not a good player. You know, really, I'm just a builder who just deals with the survival elements as best I can. Um, but even with that being said, if you're in any kind of decent armor, you can just walk up and kill anything with two two hits. If you have any sort of even moderately decently enchanted stuff, you know. So I'd like to see something added to the game that would make you use a shield. Really, I mean, I know it will block arrows, but you you don't need it. You can just take an arrow hit and walk up and kill the thing that's shooting you. You know, um, it, my my sort of running joke with my Discord is is I want to see ogres added to the game. I always thought those would be great. Uh, which would if you don't have a shield, those things will end you immediately. You know, I think that would be kind of fun and just like a natural spawn. You know, something like that. Something then like a really slow weapon added would be kind of cool, like a battle hammer or something like that. That again, if the other player or it doesn't have a shield, then they're going to be in big trouble. You know, I think that could be something, something to work on with, with timing. Cause you only get one swing. And if you miss your one swing, then you have a few seconds where you're in, you know, you're unarmed essentially while it's recharging. I think that could be kind of fun to add. I would imagine that things like an ogre would present some pathing issues, but I feel like, it would be cool to have some sort of overworld aggressive mob in the realm of like a ghast scale wise or bigger than an iron golem. You know, like right now everything is like player size. We, we don't have anything big and threatening in the overworld. Uh, and, and I think that would be really cool. I think, again, like I said, part of the problem is that it would probably likely get stuck in a, in a lot of places because it wouldn't fit between trees and things like that. But I think like a land-based thing, like an ogre would be really cool. It, it, I'm still I'm still holding out hope for them adding the redstone beasts from dungeons. Oh that yeah, they've, right. They, they've kind of showcased, showcased them front and center in the trailers. And if you want to, uh, a battle hammer one of the characters in dungeons seems to be wielding a hammer in the trailers i did so see that there is there is potential for that stuff to cross over into minecraft if they can find a good way to implement it and even if not i think anybody who's into modding the game whether that be through actual you know forge and you know plugged in mods like that or just through data packs might be able to add some of that stuff once the parameters can be more fine-tuned with some of the new properties they're adding to these weapons you know, I, 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 about the the food ideas too. Just so so I don't forget. You know, there's a mod out there, and uh, you guys probably know. Is it is it maybe Pam's or is it better better food or something? Where where you lose uh you lose your the effectiveness of food the more often you consume the same food without changing. Do you guys know what I'm talking uh, about? I don't recall if that's a feature of Pam's or not. I haven't played enough with food mods to really figure that one out no i'm not sure some sort of mechanic like that might not be a bad idea because i think i think most of us probably just eat the same food like all the time right uh, um uh maybe something where if you eat the same food 20 times or 32 times to get, make it a minecrafty number then then you start to lose how effective that food is so you have to go get something else that might not be a, a terrible idea or maybe even if just you lose saturation or something like that to show that your character is tired of eating chicken for three and a half consecutive years <laughs> Getting constipated from eating all of that <laughs> exactly. steak, probably, yeah. Um, well, this kind of ties into what you wanted to bring to the table in our round table. We did have one other email we wanted to address, but I think we will move that to the render distance. So, fix it. Uh, you had some thoughts about armor that you wanted to bring to the table this week. Well, okay, I did. It, it, I think that it's, you know, as I, I love this game. We've been playing it for years, and I think one of, one thing I really appreciate you guys is is every time on your, on your podcast, we're like, well, we should change this or this or this, but... Mods, you're doing a great job. We love you and all that stuff. And I, you know, I want to say I'm in, I'm in team. We love you mods because man, I cannot believe that we're playing a game that's 10 years old and we get all this constant updates and all these things. It's so great, but there's a few problems with armor. I think is that most of it is useless. You know, who wears leather armor? Like no one wears leather armor. You know, you skip it. Mm -hmm. You don't wear it in the beginning. If you start a brand new world, you're wearing iron armor in what? Half an hour, maybe. Yeah. You know, I can find iron before I can find cows in most vanilla worlds. I start exactly, so. yeah, exactly, and and then and then very quickly after that, you go up to diamond armor, and then you never look back for the most part. You know, I, I think there they, I think something needs to be a perk in order to wear different armor, just to mix up. If you're playing on a server with thirty other people, wouldn't it be great if? there were five different kinds of armor that everyone was wearing because each one gives you its own abilities. So like my idea, iron armor, just keep it exactly as is. It's like the, the basis. It's the, uh, 
uh, it's the standard. Diamond armor, this is going to be the one that everyone hates, is you're not allowed to sprint with diamond armor because you have to have something that's going to make people, some people, not want to wear it. Because it, it's god armor already. It's awesome. It, mobs can't really hurt you with that, right? Um, but then, leather armor you can get some perks. If you're wearing all four pieces of leather armor, then you would get a speed one boost to your sprint. So you can actually sprint faster and you get a 20% chance to dodge attacks. So yeah, attacks are going to hurt more when they hit, but they might not hit at all. I think that if you did something like that and you're playing on a multiplayer server, even PVP or whatever, I think you could see people say, like, oh no, I want to wear leather armor because I want to run faster or no, I don't care. I'll, I'll walk slow, but I'm going to wear this awesome, amazing diamond armor, things like that, you know? I have some other ideas for the other two. Gold, maybe some sort of enhanced EXP or something like that. It kind of goes along with it a little bit. Uh, maybe chain, you only get a 10% chance to dodge, but you get the protection of iron armor. You know, maybe a hybrid or something like that. But I don't know what, you know, if you guys had any thoughts on it, but I would love to encourage people because I started wearing only leather armor um, about six months ago, just as a challenge to myself. And I found the game a thousand percent in the survival element more fun. Yeah, it's actually survival. It's actually, sometimes it's scary. Sometimes a couple of skeletons could take you out. Yeah, Joel can speak to that as a matter of experience because he only wears iron armor. Yes, yeah, and I will say that um, iron armor, when you're wearing elytra with no chest plate, a couple of skeletons is bad news. Yeah. You've got four, maybe five hits before you are in dangerous territory. And if there's anything else around, like a spider or a baby zombie or anything that, that complicates the the situation it can become quite dicey quite quickly i've i've become overconfident in some places and and lost uh, also uh creepers when they blow up next to you with iron armor they will kill you you don't you don't get there's no surviving that you do it's 100 you are dead i uh, happened to be live on stream yesterday it, as a matter of fact do you have <laughs> a do you have um uh explosion protection on your diamond armor does it help uh or my i don't i mean my leather, iron, iron armor? I meant, yeah my iron is all just protection and then just the typical like you know water breathing uh what's the other one on uh, depth strider feather falling like that kind of stuff uh that that's the thing that i find that i, I miss about uh about the armors like I, I died recently and my boots got lost somehow and so i don't have depth strider and so whenever i'm working on a redstone uh waterway uh with with water transportation and i have to walk upstream i'm always like oh man wow i forgot how much of a pain in the butt this is um, but one of the reasons why I stopped wearing diamond armor is because, you know, you get all this gear, you try to get to get ready to fight the dragon, you put all these enchants on it, and then it just knocks you off the edge of something. It's like, well, <laughs> none of that mattered. And it was expensive and it was a pain in the butt. So um, I find that iron, because we have, um, it's not working right now, but because we have an iron armor or an iron farm on the server, I mean, like, I don't need to even worry about um, diamonds being, you know, finite or hard to find. I can just use iron and just renew it and just build more stuff whenever I need to. I do wish there was a little bit more, you know, customization. I wish you could do, I wish you could dye iron armor. You know, it would be nice if you had like different, you know, sashes or something, you know, crests or something on it that you could have like red, yellow, blue, like for, for multiplayer, it would be nice to kind of look different from everybody. Cause ultimately, you know, one of the reasons why I don't wear iron armor is because I think it, the diamond armor looks dumb. I don't like being a big blue smurf in Minecraft. <laughs> I find it, it just is not to me as, as appealing as a, when you do what little RP I do, uh, it's not really up my alley. I'm wondering with the, the upcoming changes to the nether update, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that they said that wearing gold armor around Piglin will either pacify them or allow you to trade with them. I can't remember, but yeah, it's like if, they, if they're they, mad at you, the gold armor will will they'll ignore you. Yeah, they they attack you unless you're wearing a full suit of gold armor. Seems to be ah, the the mechanics yeah. they're working with right now. That's still not in snapshots, even so. There's mm. yet to be any community feedback on that. But I like Just the, the idea. Notes, yeah, yeah. Um, I I also like Fixit's idea of having you needing all of the pieces of a set of armor in order to get the kind of set bonus. I'm thinking yeah. back to my Terraria playing days where you would have a whole bunch of different materials you could make armor out of and each of them gave you initially like a bonus to defense but then some of them would get you a speed bonus and some of them had like other abilities some of them even summoned little critters that could help you fight if you had certain sets of armor and obviously terraria is the, one of those kitchen sink kind of games where it seems like if they had an idea they implemented it straight away whereas minecraft feels a bit more balanced but I do like the idea of giving people incentives to have the other different kinds of armor. And while obviously, for the most part, I'm wearing diamond armor with elytra, so I'm not entirely certain if 
nerfing the sprint would necessarily affect me, but also if I wasn't wearing all four pieces of the diamond armor, would it still nerf me? There's a little bit of balancing to be done in that regard, but it's certainly something that I can see them bringing to the table. Speaking of which, uh, we still don't know what the smithing table is going to do, and if that could be used to augment certain types of armor in that sense, if we could have a way of applying these permanent buffs, like you could apply a speed one potion to certain types of armor. I feel like that would be an interesting uh, way to work that in that we haven't really uh, haven't really figured out what the smithing table is going to be for yet. Yeah, I like the idea of, of adding things to armor. Like if you wanted to use iron and you only had one diamond, you could temporarily put a diamond into your chest plate like a gem, you know? <laughs> like a, you... like an Iron Man style diamond <laughs> yeah. in the center to, kind of thing. Yeah, well, exactly. But but in, to, to fix its point, it would bridge that gap between beginner and like nothing can hurt me. Yeah. And rather than just holding out and going for the full iron uh, diamond armor, you could just be like, well, maybe this is good enough for now. You know, like maybe this will sustain me for a while and I can put my diamonds towards tools instead of having to protect myself right away from all this kind of stuff. I, um, I, I like the idea of the sets. I think that would be really cool. And it would be even more beneficial if aesthetically the sets looked different. Like if you had leather for speed, um, having that leather armor look like it was um, something more spectacular than it is right now. You know, like this, one of the other reasons I don't think a lot of people don't wear leather armor because it looks kind of bland. Like it's really kind of brown. <laughs> like there's, yeah. just, there's not, even when you died, it's really not that impressive, you know? Um, and it doesn't do the same thing that leather horse armor does now. Cause I don't remember the number. It's like 128 or 256 different shades of horse armor that you can do, but you can't do that with regular leather armor, right? Like it's still just the 16 main colors. Yeah, I and I think you can yeah. you can get a lot of variety in leather armor, but once again, it's do people want to like nobody really spends mm. enough time in leather armor unless you're doing say a PvP mini game where you want to make sure everyone's on the red team versus the blue team or something. Yeah, like that, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, you I just like the to... idea of taking a leather helmet and, a, and an iron helmet and combining them or something, and then getting the color but also the iron protection. You know, yeah, having like armor plating underneath there or something would be kind of fun. I I like mm. that, and so yeah, it still remains to be seen how much the changes in the combat update are going to change the way people like approach combat in other ways, like ex exactly how you know, armor gets buffed exactly how people are going to adapt to some of the newer stuff that's coming in and, and, and what, if, if any mini games come out of the new mechanics, that kind of thing, it's going to be, it's going to be kind of fun to, uh, to see that. Um, Joel, how about you? What are you bringing to the table this week? My, my topic is relatively short, so we can just tack that on at the end. Okay. Um, so I was thinking a lot recently about resource pack block replacement uh i've been back and forth on the fence because i have been hitting a wall with the modern city in terms of what textures i can use that better reflect modern materials and you really get pigeonholed into some narrow um, textures in that so we've all seen resource packs that tweak existing blocks to be quote unquote better in the eyes of the tweaker uh while staying very close to vanilla game this is the kind of thing that i do all the time you know like i'll tweak the potato texture i'll make custom beet roots you know like i'll make nether brick um instead of wine colored it's black like just not huge changes the, the people watching can generally see what's going on it's just a little bit of a, of a change uh we've also seen it packs that replace blocks that don't suit what you're trying to do for example glazed terracotta when i was playing on vastin with fix it didn't match the medieval theme of the world in the lore it just doesn't really go by bright magenta arrows not a thing right so you replace that texture with something else entirely and i love the way that some of those packs add that uh with the must needed textures but it always feels a bit i don't want to say dirty but like it feels like you're somehow breaking the rules when you're replacing a block so i wanted to ask you guys if you think there could be a better way to implement resource packs would allowing players to create their own blocks or a block variant be that disruptive to the game uh would it be better if something like a data pack allowed you to add a new block without replacing an existing block or using something laggy like an armor stand holding a block enlarged and positioned in the world to make it kind of fake it which is kind of what we have to do um we have the data pack for chuck chucks tables and chairs on the citadel and that's essentially what's going on so you can't necessarily build walls of chairs because it'll start to really leg out your world um what about the ability to use a frame and apply a texture to it because more often than not i can use some of the textures the problem is that like say concrete 
doesn't have any other thing, uh, you know, anything going on for it other than just a straight up block, which is too big for a lot of what I want to do uh, in a modern city. Uh, I don't remember the name of this mod. I tried to find it quickly before the show and I couldn't figure it out. But I've seen this happen in other mod packs where people will build like a wooden frame of a slab or a stair or a um, trap door and then apply whatever texture they want to it. What Do you guys remember what... Um... Yeah, that's um, Carpenter's Blocks. Is that what yeah. that is? Yeah, cool. I th I th I'm pretty sure that's the one you're talking about. Slopes and stairs and walls and fences and everything, yeah. Yeah, and I don't necessarily want to go the uh, you know the 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 non Minecraft block of like having triangles and slopes and things like that. But uh, just to me, it's just one of those things where I really want to do something like either a modern city texture pack or maybe even a sci-fi texture pack. But I just find that I'm just with a sci-fi, it's a little bit easier because you're basically replacing almost everything. Whereas with the modern city, you still want grass and trees and rocks and things, but you just, you want to switch out some stuff to have some metal or some textures in the game that feel more modern. So what do, what do you guys think about having like new blocks being something that players could add to the game? Or do you feel like that's just what modded is for? Uh, fix it. We'll start with you because I know that you've got a lot of experience with resource packs. Well, you know, I from from my understanding, this this predates my Minecraft playing a little bit, I think. But from my understanding, you used to be able to change the model of of almost every block or maybe even every block in the game, and that was changed. So the way it is now, like if it, if it, if the if the model is a block, like a sixteen pixel by sixteen pixel by sixteen pixel block, then that's all it can ever be. And if you try to put, make say a block, turn it into a lamp, well then it's going to be still not transparent on the sides of that, that size. Right? right. And I think in part that was taken out because of um, X-ray texture packs. I think pixels, you may know more about that than I do, but I think people were using it to cheat and find ores quickly and things like that. Is that right? If you could set transparencies for certain things, mm -hmm. and yeah, there, there's definitely stuff like that that it's still floating around. There are some ways that people try and do that stuff, but I think I think typically, if that's not been removed from the game entirely, then it's still something that servers will catch you doing pretty quick. But uh, yeah, I, I feel I feel like there have been options to do stuff like that in the past, which the the resource pack format changed sort of fairly recently and now there are very specific ways you can interact with each thing yeah if if a block's not a block shape then you can remodel to to just about anything you want i know we have a couple of those in in our uh, realm of aston texture pack um but yeah i you know adding in adding in blocks uh it can be tricky I think what I'd what I'd like to see uh, that would solve your modern city look and and everything else. And this brings me back to episode nineteen of the Spawn Chunks is is stairs and slabs and walls for concrete. <laughs> would, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. That that and that's and that's where I think the idea of that carpenter block mod kind of comes into me is that you know we've got the new scaffolding block that they that they put out with the bamboo. And I'm just thinking like, you know, would it be like, what if it was an in-game thing? Like, I'm not saying make it easy. I'm not saying add it to the inventory because we've, we've also complained, you know, about the, the inventory issues in the game. But, but if you had a new kind of block structure in the game, call it a frame block, I don't know, we'll call it that. Uh, you, you new material, you have to make it out of metal or steel or something. Um, but then once you have it, if you combine that block with an existing concrete block, then you can change that to slabs or stairs or whatever, or you could, you know, apply different textures to different things or, you know, like try and have it be something that the player could then add something to it. Um, I mean, ultimately, I guess it just ends up being like, you know, I feel like there are some, I feel hamstrung creatively by the lack of textures beyond building castles yeah you know, and and medieval stuff in minecraft a lot i, I think and paint would solve a lot of those problems wouldn't it if you just could paint in yeah, the 16 primary that, colors yeah that would that would help too you know being able to to paint something like um even the stone texture if you change that into a painted stone then that would make sense for like the side of a building that would be made out of concrete or something that you know doesn't quite work and but then stone of course has slabs and stairs and if you could paint those different colors then you could probably get around a lot of that, that kind of thing yeah no I, I think paint would be a good way to, to go as well but again like they, they they feel like these things like well painting blocks we can already die uh, some blocks in the game but not all and it does kind of make you wonder like well how what's the principles like i've not been able to find the the game 
um, design principles behind why you can be super creative with like wool color and horse armor, but you can't dye other things or paint wood or do things like that. It just, it feels like they're, it's almost arbitrary how some of the, some of the, the roadblocks are. And, and again, this is because I'm trying to build a modern city. And if I was, when I, the few times that I've been doing rustic cabins and, uh, and, you know, medieval bridges, I'm fine. <laughs> I've got lots to play with. Um, you know, it just, I find that there's been this weird kind of hole there. I think it comes down to their vision for how the technology of the world should exist in the lore they have behind the scenes, which, once again, like you say, is kind of frustrating that we don't know more about that. And while they want to project, mm. they want players to project their own lore onto the worlds that they create, it's also the case that they have this idea. Um, I think when conduits were introduced, that was an example of stuff like beacons, where it occupies this weird kind of it's not necessarily a concept you see all the time in fantasy literature but it's got a very fantasy feel and i think mm -hmm. one of their design principles is that minecraft should be low tech and that really limits you in terms of the amount of stuff that you can be seen doing with like pipes that would look like modern city kind of stuff like we're we're stuck using things like walls for pipes or fences when you want to you know show something as being a pipe you just stick like an acacia fence up the side of thing and you go yeah that's a copper pipe sure it doesn't mm -hmm. quite work i mean maybe you have you have things like granite walls that have been added recently that maybe add to that but it can only go so far for me i i don't know the, whenever the the resource pack stuff comes up i am so much of a vanilla default fan or, or not necessarily a fan like i'm not super attached to it and if it was different from the outset then i feel like i would be fine with it but there's just something about the puzzle to me of figuring out how to make things look best with the blocks that we have with the textures that we have with default vanilla that that is part of the game for me in an intrinsic way that i can't really remove and so like in the back of my mind i always joke that like resource packs are cheating <laughs> because mm. i i like more than anything having to struggle through the creative process of figuring out how my imagination can best fill in the cracks in what i've been given and then you know figure out how best how to make it look best how to sort of please the part of me that goes you know that doesn't quite look right and then making it look as good as it possibly can and letting my imagination do the rest of the work yeah so so I, i'm I think... i'm not necessarily in the habit of thinking well yeah no resource pack would do really well occasionally i see them and it's like forbidden fruit for me i'm like no i can't touch that i'm not allowed can't touch that yeah yeah, yeah. I, I and i appreciate that and that's why i feel like i'm kind of on that fence of like you know getting too into the texture pack and getting halfway there feels kind of cheaty whereas if you're like all right i'm doing a sci-fi build nothing in minecraft is really sci-fi so we have to basically just redesign everything at which point it just looks like a completely different game and that yeah. to me is like less of a we'll quote we'll say quote unquote cheaty you know than a few blocks you know like taking the glazed terracotta and turning them into really attractive roof tiles you know yeah. like stuff it's like that which looks great but you just you kind of feel like well but if if someone downloads this and, and they fly by with the vanilla texture pack it looks like a bunch of magenta arrows on the roofs of all my medieval houses yeah which really, you know this might be a question for the server admins out there i'm not sure if either of you folks have experience with this but is there a way through data packs or command blocks that you can you can have a bunch of resource packs loaded onto a server and then have somebody load a resource pack automatically when they enter a specific area of a world. I know you can force resource packs when you log into a world for the first time, but is it possible to do that once a player is already logged in? You know, I, I know of one server that does that, and I don't know how they do it. I would suspect they do it with that um, that multi multi-world plug-in i i'm, I'm yeah they're using bungee cord right yeah. um but uh the minecraft middle earth does that where each different uh -huh. section of the world that they make has its own texture pack like if you're in uh if you're in the shire then it has a shire texture pack and then if you go to mordor then it has a mordor texture pack you know and just and just you know it asks you yes or no do you want to download it and of course you hit yes and then it just loads up yeah, I, I expect that is probably done, like you said, through having multiple servers technically, and Bungie Cord is just connecting you from one server to the other when you travel to a certain place. So 
yeah, I, I can't I can't see a way currently to implement that on a single vanilla server. And of course, Bungie Cord, you have to host multiple servers from that, so it tends to get a little bit intensive and expensive. But I, yeah, I, I like the idea of being able to go to, say, Joel's Modern City, and it says, okay, this requires this texture pack, download that, and then every time you go there, it loads up with a different texture pack that would be different when you leave a certain area. And I think yeah. that might get around the problem you're having of wanting to apply a certain set of textures here but not having that apply when you go back to uh, dartmouth meadows or somewhere yeah no that's a really good point because one of the reasons why i haven't uh taken that plunge that i've seen other um texture pack creators do in changing all of the iron in minecraft to match iron tools like you know hoppers and cauldrons and anvils have a different iron than an iron block yeah. or an iron you know um fence or um what's the other one that's different um iron trapdoors white shiny you know but i have this really cool greenhouse build where i used white glass and a lot of iron trapdoors and it would look very dumb if it all switched to um cast iron <laughs> like it just it wouldn't it would look like a greenhouse at all it, it would look like something entirely different and and so i don't do that because i just i don't want to have to flip back and forth um but i am contemplating the idea of having texture packs where um you just have to switch texture packs. We'll just supply the texture packs to the different members on the server. It's like, hey, if you come to visit the modern city, make sure that you pop your modern city texture pack at the top of your list so that the few things that we might change uh, will help. Um, the roadblock that I find, like I, I know like with you, I, I have that thing where like I do try to push it to like be as creative as I can. I enjoy the challenge uh, very often of of taking say like a lego build and trying to translate it into the minecraft which doesn't always work but you kind of have to like make some sacrifices and and you feel accomplished when you've achieved the best that you can but then i get into situations where gray powdered concrete is fantastic for road texture i can't go up in any increment slower than or lower than a meter it yeah. it looks it really breaks the immersion when you know that you can do slabs in other ways. So what we're trying to come up with, like when I'm doing roads, like all the roads in the city are flat because I can't have the slab that I want. Um, if I'm going up a road, it has to be a different texture. So we're going to be using stone and we're just going to try to make it look as much like a road as possible. And it sort of works, but at least it gives us this soft incline in Minecraft compared to like one meter jumps. And I find that in some of the ideas that I have for a modern city, it's less about the, I can almost do it. It's like, nope, I can't do that build because I don't have, you know, a way to make that look the way that I would want. You know, I generally, like I find, I find cars very tricky, like just wool cars. They, it's, you know, it's, it really becomes kind of like toy dinkies quite quickly. But mm -hmm. anyway, I don't want to take up too much. Uh, it was kind of a big show this week. Uh, we have a lot to, to cover and I know that Johnny's got a really cool topic that I want to get to as well. Yeah, um, I have a question for you guys to start off this topic. How often do you play board games? Fix it. <laughs> well, I've been playing a lot of Candyland, so that's been fun. <laughs> Occasionally, we mix in shoots and ladders. Uh, I have a two-year-old nice. and a four-year-old, so yeah, that's pretty much how <laughs> the board game. When I was younger in in pre kids and stuff, I used to play uh, a decent amount of board games, like uh, Axis and Allies, a lot. We played that a lot when I was a kid. But uh, yeah, it's been it's been some time since uh, being married and all that kind of stuff uh, rolls around. But um, I'm very curious to, to the Minecraft game coming out. Yes, uh, that is part of why I wanted to chat about this, because I got a chance to play Builders and Biomes. I got my copy before Christmas. I took it with me to play with my American family, my wife's uh, family, and uh, we had a lot of fun. How about you, Joel, uh, before we move on? How, how often do you get to play board games? So I like board games, but um, I have this issue where a lot of my friends are in uh, Fix It's Boat where they have uh, kids under 10 and mm -hmm. they're very busy and it is hard to kind of set aside that time to get together. I do enjoy a good round of like Settlers of Catan with my friends Peyton and his wife Lee. Uh, I, I, I've enjoyed other things like uh, when I worked in retail, we had a, a, a work group that used to get together once a week, I think, and did a D and D campaign, which I thought was really fun. It was my first experience really doing that kind of thing seriously. Uh, I would love to take the time to do that. The problem that I find for me is the effort uh, or convincing everyone of the effort to then go someplace and show up, you know, and and do that. 
um, is a little bit tricky. I don't have a vehicle. I have to bus everywhere in the city and it's doable, but it, you know, in bad weather and stuff like that, it's a lot easier to kind of sit home and play video games than it is to get together and play a board game. I like them. I just don't have the opportunity to play them that often. I actually own a copy of what looks to be a very cute game called Unstable Unicorns. Uh, and that's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a low, it's a low, it's a low bar. Like it's just a deck of cards and it's like a, you know, if you've ever played Munchkin, it's very, it looks like it's very similar to that. The idea is that you're supposed to mess with your neighbor, play the most powerful unicorn in your deck, uh, and then try to, 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 um, anger your, your, um, your opponents or make friends around the table to win. Unstable uh, Unicorn it, sounds a bit like a, a spin-off series from Bojack Horseman to me. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it has that kind of flavor. They're all very like little RPG looking unicorns, but they all have like, you know, magic powers or machine guns. Or, like I mean, it's over the top silly stuff, right? Uh one of them is like the death unicorn. So like everybody thinks of unicorns as these majestic, you know, creatures and this thing is like, you know, the demon spawn. <laughs> like so there's there's a lot of fun to it. But again, it's it's in the box. It's in the box on my bar and I've never I've never opened it because it just you know, I, I either have too many people over to play a game where you'd have to you'd end up excluding two thirds of your company, uh, or not enough. It's just me and one other person hanging out. So I don't have the opportunities. Uh, how right. did how many people did you get around the table playing Builders and Biomes? Uh, it plays between two and four, and we had four this time because uh, my brother-in-law was uh, very keen to play a lot of board games while we were over there. So I managed to break out this one with him and uh, my wife's younger half sister, and me and my wife. And so, yeah, it's a competitive game. Gameplay is pretty solid. Um, the Minecraft theme is relatively light. I mean, everything is basically like illustrated based on minecraft aesthetics right so it all looks like scenes from the game it's characters from the game it's mobs um and it's even got this uh four by four by four cube of little wooden cubes sort of larger than the average six-sided die so they're, they're quite nice and tactile um but you don't really need to know a lot about minecraft to play it which i think is a big selling point because a lot of kids are going to be interested in playing this game because it's got the minecraft aesthetic but parents aren't going to want a game where their kid is going to be able to beat them every single time because they know more about this game and they have time to read the minecraft wiki and that kind of thing um well i'm, I'm sure many parents would just let the kids win regardless <laughs> i think it's kind of fun to have something that's got you know elements of competition in there that aren't based just on your knowledge of the game so in order to win, uh, you score points in three separate rounds. The first, you have to collect tiles of the same type of biome. There are four biomes in the game. There are forest, mountains, desert, and tundra. Um, and they're ranked in kind of order of rarity. So you get more points for the more tundras you collect, but they are typically more rare. Uh, the second, you collect structures made of the same material. Again, there are four materials, wood, stone, sandstone, and obsidian which, once again, score you more points the rarer they are. And collecting the same type of structures will score you points in the third round. So there are art builds that are just kind of like a disco-style dance floor made of wool. Uh, there are houses, there are farms, and there are bridges. And once again, they each score you uh, a higher amount of points, but they are rarer to get hold of. Um, the... So your goal is to try to collect like as many houses as possible, or farms depending on what you're like how you're seeing them in the yeah, game. Yeah, you you kind of collect them as sets, but part of the game it, it feels like playing Minecraft in a kind of abstract way because there are elements of exploration. You start off with all of the game tiles, these kind of biome tiles face down in stacks of 4, and as you move around the spaces between them, you kind of lay them out in a grid, but you're moving along the lines of a grid. And you stop at the intersections of these lines and you overturn the four tiles that you are on the corners of, basically. So you overturn the tiles you're adjacent to and uh, there are multiple different actions that you can perform in a turn. One of which is resource gathering, which is you take two cubes from the giant stack of the 4x4 wooden cubes and they each represent different types of resources. You spend those in order to pick up the tiles and then you add the tiles to a board and the tiles are the things that have the biome type, uh, a structure of some kind, and what the structure is made out of, listed as little icons in the corner of the tiles. So as long as you understand what those icons mean, you don't really need to know anything about their significance in Minecraft. So right. yeah, it's, it's nice and easy to get the hang of for people who aren't really that familiar with it. Um, around the outside of the board, in addition to this 4x4 grid, there are rows of chests, 
uh, which contain items which can be weapons. Uh, I think one is a pickaxe that allows you to, if you are uh, fighting something with it, then you can claim an extra block. So there are different ways of using that stuff strategically, but you, if you see a mob, the mobs will turn over as though they were terrain tiles, but then suddenly there's a, a witch or something, which you don't have to fight immediately, but you can come back and fight it later. Um, and you will pick up weapons because typically you don't have enough uh, power to begin with in order to fight these things. You have a little stack of tiles that are your attack tiles. Three of them are poisonous potatoes and only two of them are swords. I think that's how it works. Um, and so the swords can do a certain amount of damage, but it doesn't start you out with enough damage to take down a witch. So if you want to go and fight those mobs and you get bonuses for fighting mobs that add to your score at the end of the game, then you end up having to go out in search of items that will help you take them on. But then there's still a chance for you to draw a poisonous potato out of the stack. So it's got <laughs> a little bit of a sense of humor and a referential thing to like you're trying to fight a witch swinging a potato at it. Um... But yeah, it, it's difficult to explain verbally like most board games are, but I think it's a pretty solid game. I think the Minecraft theme would be difficult to capture any other way because it's so difficult to simulate the experience of sitting down and playing a first-person video game with all of these blocks and all of the potential, but I like the fact that there are elements of resource gathering, exploration, combat, and building and the game is balanced between those elements to the extent that you can still win if you don't want to fight mobs. Or, you know, you can still win by fighting a ton of stuff if that's your objective instead of spending time trying to collect the difficult resources. So that there's actually a couple of different ways that you can win if you're strategic enough about it. And that, I feel like, appeals to the types of community sub communities that exist within minecraft if you're more interested in exploration or combat or building there are ways to win builders and biomes that kind of conform to each of those disciplines within the game itself hmm. I, I love the idea that there's Dude. different ways to win that's so minecraft and i can't think of any other games off the top of my head that are like that that's that's great you can be terrible at pvp like me and still have a chance yeah. The one thing I wish was present in this game was a cooperative mode, because obviously one of the biggest parts for us, especially as people who play on SMPs where we're just kind of building collaboratively, is having a way other than just maybe like two people controlling one character in this uh, to, to play cooperatively and to try and build the biggest thing. Um, it, it is a competitive game, ultimately. There has to be a winner, I guess, unless you want to house rule it really heavily and just figure out how you can achieve the biggest collective score or something like that. But there is, um, yeah, th there is perhaps the only thing I felt was lacking from it as far as reenacting the feel of Minecraft through a board game was maybe lacking that collaborative element that can happen. How do you feel about moving between the stacks? Because I was looking at the layout of the pieces on one of the marketing shots and thinking like okay so it feels like it's mostly a card game it didn't look like a board game but now that you say you know moving between the stacks i can kind of see you know what you mean did you find that it do you think it would have been better had there been a board similar to how Catan lays out their board and then you have you move along it um would you if you had places to put these stacks of cards do you, and with roads in between would that be better as an experience or do you think it, it's fine the way it is uh, in a sense, it's fine the way it is. It did take a while getting used to that because you're used to, if you're playing tile-based games like Catan, or I think the thing that I find is closest to this is um, Forbidden Desert is another game I played like this where you effectively, your archaeologists looking for artifacts before they sink into the desert sands. And so you're constantly flipping over tiles in the game to show that they are slowly getting, you know, swallowed up by a sandstorm. And you're trying to have to, like preserve these tiles and flip them back over to their other side in order to show that they're still there and you're you're moving your characters onto those tiles as specific locations instead of moving them around this kind of almost invisible grid as far as the gameplay components go but there, again that might be incentive for people who enjoy playing this to draw a mat on like a decent sized piece of paper where you could draw out a grid where you want to place these tiles and mm. customize that stuff yourself and I, I feel like that's not an excuse for them not to have something like that in the box, but the box already has a fair amount of components. I feel like having an extra play board for all of the stuff to go on might complicate things a little bit. Um, yeah. Could I also think, be a cost thing too. 
Yes, exactly. You know, trying to keep their costs down. It's not a particularly cheap game, but it's not on the most expensive scale either. It's not like Arkham Horror or anything, but it's it tends to be uh, yeah, it's 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 a decently priced board game. And yeah, I, I thought overall I need to play it a bit more because we only got in one or two rounds of it while we were over in the States and I haven't played it with uh, our, our usual friend who comes over to play board games with us more regularly, but I think it's worth a go. I'm I'm pleasantly surprised. I don't have much experience with the other merchandise Minecraft has come out with in the past, but when they came out with a card game a while ago, it didn't quite have the right feel. Uh, some of the crafting recipes weren't exactly like the recipes you had in games, so it felt like it had been made with like a lower attention to detail than this game has been made with. And I think it's going to be really interesting, hopefully in the future, to get some input from the people who made it. If we can talk to some of them on the show, or at least get an email from them to talk about some of the process that went into building it. Um, I think it's going to be uh, really fun, and hopefully one that you can bring out at the occasional parties as long as you don't have too many people there. But I think that's probably going to be it for today's show. Thank you so much once again for listening to The Spawn Chunks, and thank you to Fix It for joining us. Uh, take a second to plug all of the things and let people know where they can find you. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, happy to be here. Thanks, guys, for the invite. Uh, I'm on youtube.com slash fixit412. That's F-I-X-X-I-T-T. 412. I'm also on Twitch occasionally now, believe it or not. I, I, I've taken the plunge. I'm streaming over on Twitch and that's twitch.tv slash fixit412, F-I-X-X-I-T-T 412. Uh, I'm also on Twitter occasionally when my old man fingers can uh, can operate my phone correctly. Same, uh, same handle there. <laughs> Awesome stuff. All right. Uh, you can find more information about the show, links to all of Fix It stuff as well, and links to some of the stuff we've talked about today at thespawnchunks.com. The music for the show is composed by me, and we are proud, as always, to be a listener-supported podcast. If you're getting some value out of the show, consider putting some value back in by visiting patreon.com slash thespawnchunks. Pledging at any level there will get you an invite to our patrons-only Discord chat. You can join our community of 156 patrons and get us closer to our next milestone goals which is to record the spawn chunks live in our discord so that patrons can listen in as we record special thanks go out to our content engineers cameron sigelski greena canuck jd williamson and yitz for their support on this episode sharing the podcast with your friends is the easiest way to support the show it's 100 percent free you can just poke a friend in the arm and say hey you should listen to this it is fantastic I, that last part you can leave out, but just let, let people know that it's a worthwhile uh, Minecraft podcast to listen to. You can find us on Twitter at The Spun Chunks and uh, on Instagram as well. Don't forget to email the show with your thoughts, opinions, thoughts, and feelings about builders and biomes and all the things we talked about today. You can subscribe on iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, and YouTube. We are everywhere. We're like the wind. And the RSS feed is linked on thespunchunks.com, the patron-only RSS feed, is on the Patreon page, and that is where you can listen to the render distance, the extended version of the podcast. My name is Johnny, but online people know me as Pixel Riffs, and you can find most of what I do at youtube.com slash Pixel Riffs, where I attempt to make sense of this crazy and wonderful game in a series called the Minecraft Survival Guide. I've also got a Skyblock series now, and I'm streaming three days a week on Twitch, doing behind-the-scenes work for both series. I'm also the voice of the unofficial Hermitcraft recap, which you can find through a quick YouTube search, and aside from that, I'm at Pixel Riffs on both Twitter and Instagram. Joel, where can people find you online? Everything I am doing online, including my illustration and design portfolio, is at joelduggan.com. You can also find a link to the Citadel Cafe there. That is the other podcast I do. The last time I did one, it was myself and Johnny talking about Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, and The Mandalorian. It's almost two hours long. I had a fantastic time. Thank you again, dude, for coming on the show. Uh, so if you if you like us here, you will like us there, I think. Uh, you can also follow me on YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, and Instagram. It's all just my name, Joel Duggan. Super easy to find. Thanks for visiting the Spawn Chunks. The world outside is infinite, but we can fix that. <laughs>